Let's now have a closer look at the title of this MOOC, Oriental Beliefs Between Reason and Traditions. All four of these words can be interpreted in various ways and can even be quite problematic. Once you're a bit more familiar with the different interpretations of the words Oriental Beliefs Between Reason and Traditions, you can continue informing yourself about the various scholarly disciplines applied in this course. Its interdisciplinary character might confuse you because we won't always tell you explicitly what kind of methodology we are using in each particular case. Click on one of the following links to access the corresponding explanation. The very term Oriental certainly needs some careful scrutiny before we can start using it for the purposes of this course. In a purely geographical sense, our planet Earth is divided into two hemispheres. The Eastern Hemisphere comprises Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia and parts of the islands of Oceania. And the Western Hemisphere includes the Americas and again parts of Oceania. But the words East and West, with their adjectives Eastern or Oriental versus Western, generally refer to entities that are far more abstract and complex. They are therefore more difficult to define and their use may be influenced by political, cultural and other considerations related to matters of group identity. Such considerations are more often than not subjective, even if we don't always realize this. At any rate, it would be almost impossible to come up with an entirely objective and neutral definition of East or West as conceptual units. This is because if you want to define something, it is not sufficient to describe or characterize it, you also have to indicate its boundaries or in other words, show what belongs to it and what does not. And defining such boundaries is precisely what is so tricky about the concepts East, Eastern, Oriental, West and Western. At this point, please take a few minutes to do the following exercise. Take a map of the world and try to draw a clear line between what could possibly be the East and the West. It sounds simple enough in theory, but how easy is it in practice? Wherever you may have drawn the line, if you have been able to draw one at all, the truth is that this exercise is not so simple at all and that there is no worldwide agreement on what the East and the West exactly are. The politically loaded term the West in particular often refers to an entity roughly consisting of North America and Western Europe, a unit still used in the United Nations for instance, more than a quarter of a century after the demise of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, but it may also refer to Australia and New Zealand. The East, then, would include the countries of Asia, but also North Africa, even though Morocco lies further west than every country in continental Europe, except Spain and Portugal. Moreover, until the late 15th century of the Common Era, parts of the Iberian Peninsula were under Arab Muslim domination and the lasting influence of that period can still be felt today in the language and culture of this part of what is called the Latin West. In this course, other parts of medieval Europe will be highlighted as well because of the significant impact that aspects of Oriental and particularly Arab Muslim culture and scholarship had on it. Part of this culture in its turn had earlier been based on the ancient Greek civilization. The golden age of classical Arabic culture had been enriched by translations of the works of Aristotle and many other philosophers and scientists into Arabic, either directly from Greek or from Syriac translations made earlier from the Greek originals. And indeed, the traditions of ancient Greece have a prominent place in this MOOC. But these traditions existed not only in the area occupied by present-day Greece, but also in large parts of Anatolia, that is, what is now Turkey. And this is yet another example of how problematic the East-West divide really is. If East and West are complex notions for objective scholarly use, Oriental is even more problematic as a concept and the study of oriental languages and cultures as practiced in Western academia has been a source of contention over the last few decades, especially since Edward Said 
published his famous Orientalism in 1978. It is quite significant that reactions to Said's polemical essay have continued to appear for a long time, even as late as 2010. In a nutshell, in Said's vision, much of Orientalism or Oriental studies is somehow linked to colonial and neo-colonial policies and projects. As a result of these discussions and polemics on this issue in the 1980s and beyond, many universities no longer have specific departments for Oriental studies and now work with concepts such as Asian studies and Middle Eastern studies. And incidentally, the term Middle East roughly covers the same area as Near East, which just like Far East, is an undeniably Eurocentric term when you come to think of it. Near East is mostly used with reference to the more ancient periods. There is no need to elaborate on this fundamental problem any further. If you want to know more about it, you can check the Wikipedia articles on Orientalism or Oriental Studies, which have references for further reading. However, it should be clear that where universities still have Oriental Studies as an administrative department of teaching and or research, such as the Uni Université Catholique de Louvain, it has absolutely nothing to do with a lack of sensitivity with regard to the problem just alluded to, and even less to do with a neo-colonial attitude towards the languages and cultures under scrutiny. Instead, the survival of such departments should be understood almost entirely in terms of institutional politics, numbers of students and budgetary considerations. While acknowledging the historical fact that Oriental studies as a discipline originated in these universities in times when an ethnocentric approach was a norm unchallenged by anyone, the Oriental Beliefs team is fully aware of the global nature of its audience and we've done our utmost to avoid any kind of Eurocentrism, bias or prejudice. The second word in the title, beliefs, definitely refers to religion, but also to other things people may believe in, such as theories, values or identities. With regard to religious beliefs and practices in particular, it is very important, although perhaps surprising for some of you, to be aware that these are things that can be studied scientifically, just like any other phenomenon that humans can either observe or speculate about. What this means is that it can be described, scrutinized, analyzed or dissected in an objective and dispassionate manner. When scholars carry out research on beliefs, religious or otherwise, or when they teach about them according to this principle of objectivity, they will set aside their own religious feelings or ideologies and emotions while applying a rigorous method and taking critical distance from the object of their inquiries. And when comparing different religions, they certainly don't try to demonstrate the superiority of one religious or philosophical system over another, even if they strongly believe in it privately. Accordingly, you too, as participants in this MOOC, are warmly invited to learn about the beliefs and ideas of other people as social cultural phenomena around the world and throughout the ages and to reflect on, on such beliefs from a non-normative point of view and as objectively as possible. To do this, it doesn't matter if you identify as a Buddhist, a Jew, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, an agnostic, an atheist or otherwise. It just takes an open and inquisitive mind and permanent awareness that we are neither practicing nor preaching religions or other beliefs in this course. We're simply exploring and trying to better understand this fascinating aspect of human thought and behavior. And it is this very openness and neutrality that can also help us, importantly, to take all beliefs seriously and to talk with respect and empathy about what is, after all, intimately linked to people's sense of belonging and other personal feelings. Islamic culture has an Arabic expression, al-aql wa naql, which arguably corresponds to reason and traditions, although it's often translated as reasoning and revelation as well. The point here is that there is a certain tension, or at least an intricate relationship, in many ancient and modern cultures between, on the one hand, 
matters that are believed to have been revealed to humankind through a process that transcends human understanding and subsequently transmitted from generation to generation, and on the other hand, ideas that result from humans applying their own intellect independently. In this course, you will learn about both categories, separately as well as in combination. Thus, there will be information about beliefs and even superstitions concerning marvellous and awe-inspiring natural phenomena, particularly in ancient and medieval times, but also about scientific attempts at understanding their mechanisms by people who were versed in cosmology, mathematical astronomy, astrology, philosophy and theology. An important question remains, however, with regard to studying these beliefs. When doing so, precisely which scholarly disciplines are we employing? The answer is a combination of several disciplines, and the key word here is interdisciplinarity. And it is important to be aware of this, because in the various units of this MOOC, it is not always stated explicitly. Most of the time, in fact, you will be implicitly exposed to methodologies deriving from a variety of fields, including archaeology, history in general, the history of ideas, the history of religions, the history of literature, and the branch of philology called textual criticism, or in a larger sense, textual scholarship. In view of the importance of this last discipline in some of the units of this MOOC, it would be a good idea to have a look at our own explanation written especially for the present purpose, philology, the study of texts and their transmission. <laughs>